Welcome to the uh, uh, end of week two, because tomorrow is Thursday, and what do we know about Thursdays? But I'm becoming very good at calculating how many days until the next Thursday. I don't know if you've been doing that. How many days till the next Thursday at the moment? One. One. Okay, so today's the last day of the week. It's going to be a lappy morning this morning. I'll just use my laptop. Here's the program we were looking at yesterday. Uh, do you remember it starts with a comment at the top? We have the include lines that stick in two other files that literally what they, those include lines do is just before GCC compiles this, it finds those two files, one called studio.h and one called studlib.h, and I mentioned you can search on your computer and find those files yourselves if you want. It gets them and it literally sticks them in at that spot. So just before compiling, your file suddenly gets a whole heap bigger. Um, then there's the main function, which is always called main. Uh, so this is our program, let's just check. I can now, instead of, before I had two windows, remember? One window for editing the program, and then another window where I compiled it, and that saved me having to constantly exit the editor and come back in, and exit the editor and come back in. One window I changed the program, save, and the other window I'd hit compile it, and then run it. But I can do it all in one spot now, because I'm using a, a graphical thing that you guys won't have at first, but this is exactly the same as what you're doing in the terminals, so it just makes it slightly easier for me. So I just have to click this one button, and that compiles it all. So that's very convenient. And if I, I can look at the output in uh, the console, and that shows me what the program did. And let's see, what did it do? It printed out, hello world, the magic number is four. All right, let's check the program and see if that makes sense. There's our magic line at the top that we're not explaining yet, but we promised to explain, beginning with the word main, int main. Then inside, between the opening curly brace over near the arrow there, and this curly brace here is the body of the program. Uh, and first of all, it prints hello world and a new line. And we've got that over there, hello world, and then drop to a new line. Then we've got int magic number. Does anyone remember what that does? I only mentioned it very briefly. It makes a variable called... Magic number. It's telling the computer, well, it's telling the compiler, really, from now on, I'm going to be dealing with a, 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 an integer, and for convenience, I'm going to call it magic number. Notice when you're running your 4004 programs, you don't have that luxury. If your program looked like this, and you were trying to load this number into register 1, the only way you can load it into register 1 is you say, um, you know, swap, uh, swap what's at address 15 with register 1. Uh, the important thing is, you have to say the name of the, mem the address of the memory cell, number 15, to talk about that piece of memory. So if that stores an 8, the only way I can refer to that 8 is by saying whatever's stored at number um, 15. But if I wanted to talk about you, O person at seat number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, do I call you Mr. Sitting at Seat 13? You can, and I would understand it. <laughs> I can, and you would understand it, but you can see it's cumbersome. And it's not very good, because if tomorrow he sits in another seat, I'm terribly confused. So it's a sort of brittle way of referring to him. What's a better way of referring to you, a higher level of abstraction? You can call me Adam. Adam. OK. And what is your name? Adam. Adam. OK. All right. So, <laughs> all, right. Uh, all right. So I can say Adam, I can give him a name, or I can say person at seat number 13. But tomorrow, I'd have to say, the person who was at seat number 13 yesterday. And it becomes very confusing and hard to remember. Whereas Adam is always Adam. So it's convenient when talking to human beings, even though both descriptions completely precisely define him, it's a convenient description to refer to him by name. So that's what we're doing here. Instead of having to say, I want a number and store it at address 15, it's saying, I want a number, store it somewhere, I don't care where, but from now on, let's call that number magic number. And in your program, if you want to refer to that number, you don't have to say address 15, though you'll see later on you can in C say address 15, but instead you can just say magic number and the C compiler instantly knows, oh, when they say magic number, they mean the number that's stored at address 15. And it keeps a little table inside its memory while it's compiling saying where it, the, the, which memory address corresponds to which name of a variable. And I said the word then, variable. It's a variable. This means whatever's stored here you can change, it can vary. Yeah, so initially it's got the value well, what value do I give it initially? Four. But there's nothing to stop me immediately afterwards then changing it to... Six, well, 
Oh, let's try that. Let's try that. I like whenever he said 6.3. <laughs> whenever we think of something crazy, we could worry and get anxious about it, or we could look it up, or what could we do as computer programmers? We can just try it out. We can always try things out. What's going to happen now? We're going to set magic number to four, then straight away we're going to override it with 6.3. So what's going to print out? Just don't call out, just think about it. I'm going to run it. Magic number is six. Why did it print out six and not 6.3? Yes? I said magic number was an integer. It only set enough memory aside to store the whole part of the number. And I wanted to stick 6.3 in. It said, sure, Richard, you can do that. 6. Point, pff, forget the rest, who cares? <laughs> and it silently truncated the number. And it won't round it, it'll truncate. This silent changing from a decimal number into an integer, uh, that's called a type conversion. Doing it silently, modern languages don't really like doing that. They like to issue a bit of a warning when something like that goes on, because normally it's not what the programmer intended. Um, but C is not going to issue any warnings, it's just going to say, sure, okay, I've stored 6.3 into magic number, I promise. Okay, so here's our program. Are there any questions about that program before we suddenly make it fantastic? Because as yet, it's not sufficiently fantastic. Yes? If you put in 63, would that work? If I put in 63, would that work? In other words, is the Intel Pentium chip similar for, to our 4004 chip, only able to store numbers between 0 and 15, or can it store bigger numbers? Let's have a look. 63, it can. In fact, how big a number can we store in our Intel Pentium chip? What's that? Well, all these answers. Seven? Nine? No, bigger than that, guys. Hey, wait, stop. 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 You guys are going to have to have a jewel outside. What happens if you type in 6.3 times 10? Oh, what happens if you type 6.3 times 10? I like the way you want to just try things out. You know what I'm going to say? No, do you? No. I'm going to say, that's such a good question. You should go home and try that out. Okay, because this, the, what you're doing is the perfect way of learning how to program, which is you're starting to ask, well, what if, and what if, and what if? And the correct answer to what if is never, wait till next lecture and ask Richard. The answer to what if is, let's give it a go. It's a wonderful joy we have in computing that other people don't have. If an architect thinks, what would happen if I built a bridge and I used this material rather than that material? There's only expensive ways of finding out the answer to that question. But we can just try it out in one second and see. In fact, when there's something wrong with my programs, what I normally do if my program's not compiling, which happens all the time, there's always an error in my program, I save a copy of it somewhere else, and then I go into my program and change it like crazy to see if I can make it work. Just being completely relaxed, even if I'm ripping the guts out of it and throwing this bit away and that bit of away, just trying to narrow in on the one bit that's broken. Because eventually when I, in this copy, find the one that, bit that's broken, I'll go back to the original one and fix it. Doctors can't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder where the cancer is. <laughs> yeah. like, you know, it's, we have the best, best job for experimenting and trying. So, yeah, awesome question. It's a perfect question. Try it out and see if you can explain the answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, what was your name? Jace. Well done, Jace. Uh, okay, so we've got these numbers here. What's the biggest number I can store? It's very big. We'll talk about it later on. But let's be believe me, it's very big. It's, in fact, 64. Or try it out later on and prove me wrong. So we've got a magic number. We've stored it. We've printed it out. It's not very hard. If magic number is greater than what? 9,000. Then Now, whatever appears between here, this brace and this brace, I can write as much as I want in here. And it will only get executed if the magic number is greater than 9,000. If the magic number is greater than 9,000, it will enter this block and go down all the way to the bottom. If it's not, it'll just skip around the block. This is like when we're talking about uh, following a recipe. Remember I was talking about rules and rules that aren't always specified? A recipe says do this, th do this, do this. It's got all the steps in a recipe. They rarely say do step one, now do step two, now do step three. It's sort of one of the rules that isn't ever articulated is you start at the top and work down. I, well, is that, who comes from another culture here where, does anyone read bottom to top in their culture? Some cultures do. Yeah, some people go right to left, but I reckon some people go bottom to top. Does someone? Yeah? If you do top to bottom, that's Chinese. Top to bottom is Chinese. I was just wondering if there's a bottom to top people and how they do recipes. And if you end up cooking the same thing, <laughs> if you run the recipe backwards. 
Or if you have to put a cake in and you get ingredients out at the other end. <laughs> that would be awesome. Okay, so one of the things that's implied that was never really fully stated, though we did fully state it in the microprocessor, is that we're going to start at the top and we're going to go down line by line. And after doing one line, I'm going to do the line under it. And after doing that line, I'm going to do the line under it. And the program's going to execute just going down the page. And people don't even normally articulate that. It's just something that's taken for granted. With an if block, it's a bit different. You're coming down, 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 down. When you hit the if block, either you, the, com the computer at that point, while it's running, does this test. And if the test passes, it go keeps going down inside the if block. And if the test fails, it just jumps over the if block and keeps going underneath it. Okay. Um, so we were going to, if it's over 9,000, what were we going to print? I can't remember. I like toast. I like, I like Danes. I like, I love Danes. No, I like aeroplane jelly. There's so many things to like. I just want to say, uh, I was speaking to my mum on the weekend, and she told me I was a quarter Danish which I'd forgotten completely, the grandpa comes from Denmark, and I thought about it more and realised it's not actually Danes that are bad. <laughs> Just because one person in a group might let the group down, it doesn't mean they're awesome. So I think now Danes are awesome, so I'm going to print, I like Danes. So that's great. So no, we'll have no more of this sort of stuff I'm seeing on the forum of being disrespectful to another nation, who's a great nation. There we are, okay. So the magic number, oh, it didn't print I like Danes. Ah, why not? Because the number's not greater than 9,000. Yes? Uh, just a quick question. Yeah, shoot. But how would you, like, say in your tech you want to write slash n? Yes. Oh, that's a good question. What's your name? Harry. Harry's asked an excellent question. He's noticed that C here is mixing, essentially, control and data together. The data it's printing out is the text, but the slash in is sort of a bit of control, saying drop to the next line. What if you literally wanted to print out backslash n? How would you do it? Now, what am I going to say to Harry? Yeah, think about it and see if you can work it out. Okay, I'll tell you next lecture. If you haven't got it, ask me next lecture, I'll tell you. It's an awesome question. That's called escaping. You've got to work out some way of something that's normally a special command. You want to be able to just say it. Like if you're in the, um, you're at the Pentagon in the war room, and there's, a, and there's um, a big red button. Have you seen the big red button in the war room that's for launching thermonuclear attack, and next to it's a big red button for... Make an espresso. <laughs> and when they go there, the president has to have a way of escaping things when he's talking. So if he says, oh, um, I just thought of a good limerick. Uh, I like eating mutton. General, press the button. The general has to know that in this context, press the button is not an instruction from the president, but it's just something he's literally saying. It has to, it's robbed of its normal meaning. And hopefully the president, the general can work that out by context. Yeah. <laughs> so that escaping is this real difficult thing. If you're ever mixing control and data together, then sometimes the data can contain control values. How are you going to respond to that? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So think about it, try. Tell us next week, if you, uh, next lecture, if you haven't worked it out. And if you do work it out, post a post on the forum so everyone can see it. Okay. All right. Um, how are we going to test this program? It seems to be working correctly. Would you agree? We've got it equal to 64. When it's 64, it's not supposed to execute this line. We ran it. It didn't execute that line. It didn't print it out. So the program appears correct. Have we tested it thoroughly? No. How do we test it thoroughly? We, yeah, we have to test a case where it goes through the loop, and we have to test a case where it does, um, the, through the if, and a case where it doesn't go through the test, the if. So we have to do two tests. What will I make it? 9001. Oh, look at this. I like Danes. Danes, 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 Danes. Okay. Is anyone here Danish? You are. Yeah, anyone else? <laughs> Do I have any comrades? Julian. Brothers in arms. No one? What about Julian? Julian? He's... <laughs> <laughs> look, I, I he is still around, actually. I noticed him still posting on the forum. But um, uh, I, I assume he's in another country now. So we've tested. Now, this interesting thing about testing, can I just talk about that for a split second? When we were, do you remember when we were talking about estimating the number of pieces of toast it would take to fill the lecture theatre? And I said you have to get your programmer's head in, you have to scope out a puzzle. When someone gives you a problem, you've got to think instantly, what are the important things about the problem? And for me, the important th being a programmer, the important thing about that problem was, how will I know if my answer is correct or not? So I think you guys all put your effort into working out the answer, which is awesome. You didn't try it. I didn't try it. 
try it's one way of testing, but, but you know, that's like doctors. We're computer programmers. <laughs> Maybe we can work things out. Copy, Copy the lecture theater. That's how I should have done it. <laughs> Stuff. Oh, I should have made a model. A lecture theater for ants. I could have had little. OK. So what you should have done, I reckon, but of course I didn't tell you, so none of you did it. Ha ha ha, welcome to uni. <laughs> uh, is you should have spent about half your time thinking about how to work it out. But the other half, and probably the first half, I've said it in the wrong order, you probably should have spent the first half of the time thinking, how will I know when I get an answer if it's correct or not? In other words, what testing should I apply to the answer? How will I be able to test it? So this is what we're doing right now. I want to test this program's correct, so I better run some test cases through. Before we even start the testing, let's talk about the test cases so we don't miss any obvious ones. We've tested, what, 63? We're about to test 9001. Does that sound good enough? Have we done all the testing we need to do? What else would you test? 9,000, yeah, we call that a corner case, a boundary case. You definitely should test 9,000. What else should you test? Negative. Test some negative numbers. Test a, really, really big number. test a ridiculously big number. Test a ridiculously small number. Test 5,000, sorry, 8,999. Test 8,999, yeah, go down a bit, go up a bit, that's good. There's one other number where I'd probably test just because I'm a paranoid son of a gun. Zero! Zero. Zero. Yeah, it was very large and very small. I'd also test zero. It turns out, though you're not supposed to know this yet, that zero, um, when C evaluates a condition like this and works out if it's true or false, internally, C stores true and false, not as the word true and the word false. It stores true and false as, can anyone guess? As numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It stores zero for false and usually stores one for true. So to check that this is working correctly, I'd probably stick ones and zeros in here too, just to see if it's somehow getting confused between numbers which are being compared and the result of the expression, which is a, a test value, a true or false. So yeah, all those things are good tests. Yep? Uh, what's the difference between the brackets here? Ah, between the two different sorts of brackets? That's a very good question. A good syntax question. We've used two different sorts of brackets. We've used the squiggly brackets and the curvy brackets. And we sometimes call those braces and sometimes call those parentheses. Or sometimes, confusingly, just brackets. <laughs> uh, the squiggly brackets are C structure. They're used for telling C about the flow of control in the program, what order to do things in. They're used, really, to group things together. So. This brace, when I see a brace, it's in the C language. That tells me I'm starting a, a new section, a block, it calls it. And that block goes to the corresponding closed brace. Notice the block doesn't go to the first closing brace. Where's the first closing brace? Here. It's not as if this brace, oh, yes, it is. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. No, <laughs> what are you saying? Yes, it is. No, it isn't. One, zero, zero, one. Let's have a look. This brace does not get closed by this brace because before it gets there, another brace is opened. So this brace closes this brace. The compiler is mindless. It just counts the number of open and closed braces at any time. So it knows it's inside here. This brace and this brace go together. So then by the time it gets down to here, there's only one brace left open. So the next brace we see closes that brace. I've indented it to indicate how things go together. But C actually ignores indenting. So um, I, could have, I could have put this brace like this. I could have put this brace like this, and C would have still used it to close that guy, not that guy. And brace errors are a real common thing in C. If you don't indent them right, you can get confused as to what you're opening and closing. So for grouping things together in C, we use the curly braces. Parentheses have um, two meanings at the moment. One is um, the same as in maths, which is just grouping expressions together. And C, as in maths, uses the BODMAS rule. You remember the order in which you go through evaluating things? Essentially, the precedence in which it goes through evaluating things is it does brackets first, then it does multiply, then it does divide, then it does additions, then it does subtractions. Yes? Instead of braces, could we put another if Ah, what do you mean? Instead of braces, could you put another if? Inside of those braces. Oh, yeah. Can you put an if inside an if? Yeah, like a Russian doll, like nested inside each other. In fact, we use that word nesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. You could. You could say if it's greater than 9,000, do that. And you could say, oh, you could say here, what would we say? Uh, if uh, magic number is less than, no, 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 is less than 9,002. 
Oh, less than or equal to? What about this? That's how you write less than or equal to. Does that make sense? There's a less than sign than an equals to sign. And if you want to say greater than or equal to, just greater than or equal to. Yeah. Uh, equal to or less than, it'll go, what the heck are you talking about? You're from one of those countries that reads recipes from the bottom. Um, so, yeah, it's greater than or equal to or less than or equal to. Write them in the order they appear. So we could say if it's less than or equal to 9,002. So we put 9,001. You can put 9,001 if you want, sure. Okay, uh, then uh, what are we going to do here? We're going to print, print F. I really love you, man. Yeah, you understand. Okay, here we go. I like Danes. I really love you, man. The magic number is 9001. Okay, so uh, you can imagine what would happen now if it was over 9000, but not less than or equal to 9001. In that case, well, let's talk about it. Comes down to you, la, 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 la. If it's over the 9,000, it enters this gap, this area, this block here, between this brace and this brace. If it's not over 9,000, it just goes straight down to here. If it's, um, so suppose it is over 9,000, then it starts coming down here, it does that first always, then it considers another test. Is it less than or equal to 9,001? If it's less than or equal to 9,001, it does this as well, otherwise it skips over this to here, which is the end, which is the end, so it just keeps going. Okay? And, Sure, you could do that. Uh, let me just comment it out. So now it's only going to say I love you, man, if you type in 9001 exactly. Does that make sense? Is that, that wasn't what you were asking? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's test that out. I really love you, man. Oh, because we had 9001. How, what a coincidence. And if we made it 9000, it just does nothing. And if we said... Uh, yeah, you could change it. You could change it in the first one. Yeah, that'd be mean, wouldn't it? You could ch you can you can do anything in a program. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can you can say if magic number is over nine thousand, magic number equals one. Print. You said you're over nine thousand, but you're only one. <laughs> but uh, you know, there'd be no point in doing that. Okay. So does everyone understand ifs and how ifs work? Just how they affect the flow of control. There's another thing to if called an else. After an if, you can say else and a pair of braces. Now, if the magic number is less than or equal to 9001, it does that. Otherwise, if it's not, it does this. After both of those cases, it then jumps to the end. So it'll either evaluate, it'll execute the first block or it'll execute the second block. And then, in both cases, it will continue afterwards. What about... You guessed wrong. Because testing this is really annoying. I'm constantly changing the number to recompile the program and changing, changing. Oh, question at the back. Does spaces matter? That's a really good question. No. C will be quite happy if you put 100 spaces or just one. And often it'll be happy if you put none, unless that joins things, to words together and things. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. But spaces matter to us as programmers we want our program to look beautiful and clear. So we have a particular way of spacing things out. I'm doing it here. It's, we've got something called the style guide that if you click on a link at the bottom of the home page, you'll go and see the style guide. That tells you how you should lay your programs out, how you should do the spacing. Yes? Oh, could you return exit success in the middle? Oh, that's a good question. It's going to have a similar answer to the last time. Let's have a look here. When the program gets to return exit success, it stops. You could tell the program to stop in the middle. You could say, if it's over the 9,000, return exit success. Let me even say it. I'm going to comment that out temporarily. Say. Oh. oh, sorry. Hang on a sec. Hello. Uh, it's just me being funny. Uh, okay, so return easy success in the middle. Now, what will happen now? This is crazy. If the number's greater than 9,000, it'll proceed down to here. It won't print anything out because I've commented that out. If the number is less than 9,001, which in this case will only be the number less than or equal to 9,001, which in this case will only be the number 9,001, 
uh, it goes to the next line, in which case it's return and it aborts. It stops. It returns. It stops straight away. It doesn't go to the end of the if statement. That's what C does. It's like if I said to you, if you're waiting at traffic lights and they're red, and you, you know, you're going for your driving test, okay? You're going for your driving test. You're at traffic lights and they're red. What happens if you just go, man? Why don't you just press the pedal down? What'll happen? You know, do you go or are you forced to stop? The answer is, well, actually, you'll go through the red lights, even though they're red. The, the laws of physics let you go through the red lights. Cool. <laughs> it's going to speed up my trips to uni no end. <laughs> but it's a bad thing to do. Although you're technically, legally allowed to do it, it's a bad thing to do. Same with this. We're never, ever, 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 ever going to return from inside an if statement. We're only ever going to have one return at the, for, for each function, and it's going to be the very last line of the function. Even though you can do other things, we're never going to do it. Because if you do that, you're creating something called an unstructured program, which is oh, bad, very bad. Uh, how would, how, someone who's a programmer, how would you express the badness of writing unstructured code? Very bad. Very bad? <laughs> yes, 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 that's the sound I make when I see it. Spaghetti code. Unstructured code, writing code in such a way that um, you're not obeying the normal conventions of writing programs, uh, normally makes the hairs on people's arms stand up when you do it. You're legally allowed to do it. Lots of bad programmers do it, so you'll see lots of examples of code where people are just writing stuff that's legal C, so they just write it. But other people, when they look at your programs, won't understand them. They'll be confusing. Confusing means error prone. Error prone's bad because in computing, the main thing about the main obstacle we're going to face as we write our programs is making them correct. And attracting errors is just a nightmare scenario. Yes? Okay. Speaking as someone who has not absorbed the norms of programmer society, yes. to me that's ridiculous. Yes. I mean, surely you get into a situation where, you're, where if something's a certain way, you want your program to finish. Yes. And tell it to finish. Yes. Yes. It? I agree. It's, let's all just shout out, I want to finish now. Can everyone shout that out? I want to finish now. At a certain point, we want to finish. Why can't we finish? It's like, I feel like that when I'm waiting at the red lights. I'm thinking, there's no cars coming. I'm a good driver. I can do it, man. There's a car coming, but I can make it. <laughs> this rule is a stupid rule. I could get to uni so much faster if I didn't obey the rule. Yes? The down where you consider that in the red light, there will be cars coming from the other direction and a very ugly collision. No, what if there's no cars? Let me play the devil's advocate. There's no cars Okay, I'm enjoying this. Okay, so there's no cars, no one's coming, that's okay. What about if there is a car, but it's two kilometers away? It's all across the other, you can see it, but it's two kilometers away. And there's no police around. Okay, what about if it's one kilometer away? All right, what if it's 500 meters away? Yeah, but it's going really slow. Okay, what if it's 100 meters away, but you're in a super turbocharged Porsche? You calculate how fast it's going. You know you can make it. You've done the calculations. You've got an onboard simulator. <laughs> okay. But can you see where I'm going to go? It's like one of the beard arguments. Um, essentially, if, um, like, I was once an 18-year-old male. So let me tell you what it's like, for those of you who have never been an 18-year-old male. You are the best driver in the world. You have a turbocharged Porsche even if it is a Commodore or something, or a Subaru or something, you have an onboard supercomputer called your brain. You can work out everything. So when you're at the lights or doing a tricky maneuver in traffic, you are so good, you can just do it. So if, now, I'm a, I'm a cyclist, all right? I'm cycling along. I'm waiting at the side of the... I'm cycling along. I'm coming towards some red lights. Here we go. Do, 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 coming towards the red lights. And I see a mile in the distance a red car waiting. I'm thinking, oh, red car. Uh, I'm getting closer, and I'm thinking, what's he going to do? What's he going to do? He's a red car. And then I hear doof, 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 coming out of the car, and I'm thinking, uh-oh, it's a 17-year-old boy. And I'm getting closer, and I'm thinking, and rum, 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 he's getting impatient. And I'm thinking, okay, at any moment now, he could decide he can pull out safely and swerve in front of me and make it. And he will overestimate his chances of being able to do that, which is why there's such an enormous mortality of 17-year-old boys. There is. What's that? And cyclists, sadly. Um, the, so I, as I get closer to those lights, even if I'm not in the car, I will actually slow down. Because I'll think, there's a chance they won't obey that protocol. 
they'll think it's okay because they've worked it out. And if they're super bright, they'll be right. But if they're just a bit too testosterone fuel or sleep deprived, they might get it wrong and I might be dead. So then what would happen in a world like that, where you can't be confident people are going to obey the rules, is whenever you approach a traffic light, you have to slow down. Because you never know if they're going to make the right decision or not. Even though they're sure they're making the right decision, you know they might not make the right decision. Now, can you see the whole system as a whole now suffers because normal fast traffic flows you can get with people zipping down stop because as you're approaching lights, this happens to me in some overseas countries when I'm traveling. Traffic travels slowly and everyone drives like a maniac and you have to drive slowly because you're never sure when someone's going to drive like a maniac. Um, so the whole, you lose net efficiency. So it turns out you can get this emergent property of efficiency arising from a system where people, individual agents act less than optimally because... Everyone on the system knows they can rely on certain things. So if I can rely on no one ever going through a red light, if I can utterly rely on that and not think someone's going to double guess me, then when I'm approaching red lights, I can travel at 100 kilometers an hour. Even though I know there's cars waiting there that if any of them pulled out, I don't have time to brake. But I'm completely relaxed because I'm sure they're brainwashed so much into doing it. Programming is exactly the same. If you're programming just for you, like if you're a user on the road and there's no one else around, sure, break any rules you want, that's fine. But the way most programming works is you work in a team and your code lives beyond you and it gets inherited by other people. And once people start breaking the rules, thinking it's okay, I can break this rule, I can handle it, I know it, it's all right, sometimes they'll get it right. But sometimes they'll get it wrong. So when I inherit a piece of code from someone that's not necessarily obey the rules, I can't actually just use it and be reliable. I, I, I have to go through checking. So this notion of structured programming, of saying that programs have to be constrained to obey certain structures, which arose in the 70s by a brilliant guy called Dijkstra. Well, several other people did it first, but Dijkstra sort of popularized it. A brilliant mathematician uh, from Holland, or, or Denmark. <laughs> uh, this notion was that you write all your programs to look in a particular way, that you use only certain structures in certain ways. And by doing this, it turns out it makes them mathematically analyzable, so you can start to prove your programs are correct. And it makes the amount of conceptual work you've got to do as you study a program much, much smaller to understand what it's doing. And it will turn out in the end of the, end of the day, and you'll see this yourself, you don't have to believe me, um, that our big bottleneck will not be how many lines of code we have to write, because you can save a few lines by doing bad things. A big bottleneck will be we write programs that don't work beyond a certain size. They become too complex and they start having too many errors. And we will actually spend most of our time trying to minimize errors and make our programs correct rather than spending most of our time trying to save on a little bit of typing. So it turns off that there's a trade-out. And I completely agree with you. And it's a temptation faced by every programmer as we're writing. We think, oh, I could just do this dirty little thing here now. I know I'm not supposed to do it, but it would save like three lines of typing if I did it. So at the end of the course, see if you still feel like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. 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 To other people. That's right. It's a, essentially a communication protocol. And yeah. Other, can I say this? The other thing why you try to break, break the rules is, ooh, my code can just run a little bit faster if I do this. Yes. That is my main role. Ah, okay. Well, we'll get to that in 1927. Probably not in this course. But in 1927, we did a fun thing last year, I think in the first or second lecture, which is online, you can watch it, was we got someone to write a piece of code and we ran it. We ran it in C and we fully optimized it and we ran it on a supercomputer. And then we got someone to write a piece of code in BASIC, and we run it on a Toshiba laptop running at, I think, 2 megahertz, like a 10-year-old machine. And it turned out the optimized, messy, disgusting code was beaten by the Toshiba laptop running really nice code. Because it turns out the main thing that affects speed is not these little tweaks you can do that give you a 1% speed up here and there. It's picking the right algorithm, which gives you a factor of 10 speed up. So, don't put all your effort into little trivial things that just make a small difference. Work out what the main thing is. Like I said, when we're scoping out estimating in the room, work out the main thing that you're interested in solving and solve that problem first. Now, we're running low on time. I like all the questions, but maybe this will be the last one. Yeah, shoot. Uh, like, if, if you use, uh, sorry, give the magic number a value that's yes. 9,000, say 9,001, yes. would it stop in between that line? Ah, will it stop? Suppose it's 9001, let's trace it through and see what happens. Uh, or let's actually do it. All right, it's 9001 here, next line is 9001. It's greater than that, so it goes to here. It's less than that, okay? Now, if it was greater than or equal, it would do this. But if it's less than, it does the else. 
Oh, have I said it the wrong way? Oh, sorry. If it's less than or equal to, I misread the thing. Um, yeah, Richard. Uh, if it's less than or equal to 9001, it'll exit. If it's greater than or equal, uh, if it's greater than, it will do this. Is that your question? And then after both of those, it should go down and do this. However, this nasty piece of code that we wrote here will actually never get to the bottom if it's gone in this branch. It, it terminates early. Which, which, let me just get rid of that straight away before anyone ever thinks that we're suggesting that you should do that. Okay, so there's our program. Now, I was going to say testing's really good and we want to think of our test cases up front. But it's tedious to recompile a program over and over again. How much easier it would be if we could type numbers in? So let's write a way of reading numbers in. So here's how we're going to do it. Again, a piece of magic that has to go on the Richard's list of promises to explain to you how it works. There's a function called scanf. The f is like the f in printf. It's Danish. Danes invented C. And in, in Denmark, printf is how they say print. <laughs> how are you, Jert? Oh, printf. Ah, uh, yeah. OK. It's a fantastic language. Some people think the F stands for formatted, but I don't think so. OK, so scan F reads something in. You have to say what you're reading in. So this is a tiny bit of uh, magic. So percent %D, remember, is our special way of saying I'm reading in an integer, a decimal number. And you have to say where you're going to store it once they've typed it in. We have to where do we want to store it? In magic number. And if you typed it like this and compiled it, let's see what's going to happen. Oh, oh, look, how nice Xcode is. It tells me literally what the mistake is. But let's look at the error message down here. Oh, no, I didn't get it. No, I got to here first. Uh, warning, format, percent %d expects type int. But argument 2 has type int. int star. Oh, it's expecting type int star. What does this even mean? Well, it's a cryptic message that you will see often Oh, when you're programming scanf. To store it into magic number, second piece of thing, second thing that goes on the promise list I have to explain to you later, when you want to store it in there, you've got to put an ampersand in front of it. Okay. Just remember that. It, you'll hear, you'll, we'll have explained that in week three. Oh, next week, you'll know what that is. But this now says, read in an integer and store it in the variable called magic number. Let's run it, see what happens. Oh, I better print a message out front to say what I want the person to do. Print F, please. Enter a number less than 9,000. <laughs> All right, so we're saying enter a number less than 9,000. Let's run the program, see what it does. I compiled correctly, it ran. Please enter a number less than 9,000. What am I going to type in? 9,001. And it tests it. The magic number is 9,001. Okay, so it loaded nine. So at this point here, it loaded whatever I typed in into magic number, and the rest of the program went on as normal. All right, now we've got five minutes left. Does everyone understand what we just did then? We saw how ifs worked. We saw how if and else worked. We saw how to read something in um, uh, because of scanf. We talked about integers and variables and storing things in variables. I talked on and on and on about how you, write, how you have to write nice programs, even though you can't write any programs yet. But perhaps it's a good time to say it before we can write programs. You can now write very simple programs, but I want to do something more sophisticated. I want to write a program. What I'd really like is to write a program to calculate how many days it is until next Thursday. But I think that's too hard. Let's instead write a program to work out if a given year is a leap year or not. Now, this year is... 2011, is it a leap year? No, how do you know it's not a leap year? It's not divisible by four. It's not divisible by four. How do you know 2011 isn't divisible by four? Because 12 is not divisible by four? 11 is not divisible by four. Yeah, uh, okay. So you're only looking at the last two digits and working out if they're divisible by four. Is that a reasonable strategy? Turns out, yes, it is. Because... Yeah, 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 yeah. You're so keen. You're so keen. But hold on a second. Oh. Oh, let's just flash the lights on and on for everyone who's epileptic. <laughs> Have a quick look here. The story was, the claim was that 2011 is not a leap year because leap years are years that are divisible by four, and 2011 is not divisible by four. And when I said, why is it not divisible by four, he said very cleverly, because this isn't divisible by four. And I want to think, oh, how, do he know, how does he know that he only needs to look at the last two digits? Well, it turns out if you're a parent, you know lots about divisibility because you often have to share things amongst your kids. And if it's not divisible, say I have four kids. I have four kids. If I have to share something between all four of them and it's not divisible by four, 
I'm going to have something left over, a remainder. And everyone will have a fight over the remainder. So I'm very interested in calculating if things are divisible by four. When I write 2011, I actually mean that's two lots of what? That's two lots of a thousand plus zero lots of what? 100 times zero plus, let's say, 11. Another way of saying this is this is 20 lots of 100. Would you agree with that? In our wonderful decimal system. If you chalk off the last two digits, just ignore them completely, like C does when you give it a fraction, then the, first two the, the remainder tells you how many hundreds you've got. So this is 20 lots of 100 plus 11. Now I know 100 is divisible by 4, because I learned that when I was really young. So that's 20 lots of 25 for each of the girls, with 11 left over. So this is always divisible by 4, this part. So the whole thing will be divisible by 4, if and only if the last part is divisible by 4. Does that make sense? OK. So 11 is not divisible by 4. It's not a leap year. So next year, will that be a leap year? Yes. Except when they started off with the rule saying that every, why do we have leap years? To allow for mistakes. In terms of the Earth going around the sun, yeah, we essentially want winter to always be the cold time of the year. And if we get the, the period of the orbit around the sun slightly wrong, and in the number of days in the year, then slowly the year will move out of whack. So yeah, we need to adjust it. Okay. So they said, oh, look, we can adjust it. The period of the Earth around the sun is slightly more than 365 days. It's about 365 and a quarter. So why don't we say every fourth year we'll add an extra day in? But after a while, I noticed that was out of whack too. So what do they have to do? And I know you're itching to say it, say it, say it. Every. Just say one. Just one. If it's 100, if it's divisible by 100, nope. then yep. it is not a leap year. Oh, um, no, stop. No, nope. yep, yep. <laughs> well done. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, if it's divisible by 4, it is a leap year. Unless it's divisible by 100. In which case, it's not a leap year. And now that made the number of days on average roughly equal to the period of the sun. But after running for a little while longer, they noticed that was out of whack too. So, what's the final adjustment? Someone else? The final adjustment, every 400 years we have to put a day back in. Unless it's divisible by 400, which if you have 400 children you'll be very good at calculating, in which case it is. So was the year 1000 a leap year? No, it wasn't. Let's do some testing of our software, because we're about to write a program that's going to work out of a year's a leap year. What are our good test cases? A thousand should be no. Four should be, yes. Eight should be, yes. What's another good test case? 2,000. Leap year or not? Yes. No. Oh, yes. So 2,000 was a leap year. And I annoyed all my friends in the year 2000 saying, you know what? This shouldn't be a leap year this year. I mean, I bet you thought it was going to be a leap year. Yeah, yeah. You thought it was going to be a leap year, but it shouldn't be, except for another reason that it is. And yeah, so when it gets to 2,100, though, I'm going to be able to confuse everyone. That's going to be great. <laughs> so this is your formula for a leap year. So what I want you to do in the gap between now and the next lecture is somehow, using an if, or maybe two ifs, write a program that takes in a number at the top. We won't call it magic number. Maybe we'll call it year or something. And prints out either is a leap year or isn't a leap year. Oh, I haven't showed you how to work out if there's a remainder. Let me just do that in one second. Do, 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 do. If magic number uh, is divisible by 4, all I have to say is percent, if I say magic number percent 4, percent means what's the remainder after you've divided it amongst the children? So if you get the magic number, divide it amongst four people, the answer to this will be how many is left over. And how many do we want to be left over? Is that equal to 0? If you're comparing with equals, you have to use double equals. All right, write that little bit of syntax down. I'll show you the answer in the next lecture, but see if you can work it out between now and then. Okay, guys, see you next lecture.